Good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Menders. I'm the Programming Coordinator from Otis Library in Norwich, Connecticut. And I do know that we have people here from all over the country and all over the world. So if you'd like to put in chat, let us know where you're, where you're signing in from. That would be, that would be so cool to see uh, where everyone is joining us from. So this is our final program in Harris Sisters Week. So we're so happy that you could be here this evening for us for uh, the program, the Canterbury, White All Around, the Canterbury School Story as a Graphic Novel. Uh, thank you so much to Joni DiMartino from the Prudence Crandall Museum for helping us set this up. And I would also like to thank everyone who's part of our uh, Harris Sisters Committee who helped us put together so many wonderful programs this year. Please visit the Otis Library website, www.otislibrarynorwich.org. We have our Harris Sisters page up there that lists all the programs that we have this month, but also some videos that you can watch uh, that we are sharing with everyone that should that will keep those up for a while so everyone can can view those. Uh, so I'd also um, like to uh, acknowledge Bob Farwell, who is the executive director of the Otis Library, who helps every year for us to make this happen, and Alana Sherman, our uh, community our community liaison for Harris Sisters Month, uh, Regan Miner from the Norwich Historical Society, who's here with us this evening, and Kate Fields, our children's librarian, who helped coordinate so many great children's, children's videos for us this year. We really appreciate everyone's support. Uh, just a little housekeeping right now. We're just going to ask that everyone please mute their microphones if they haven't already. Uh, Joni is going to be uh, introducing us to our guest speakers this evening who were joining us from France. We are so excited to have them here with us. Uh, so if we could do that, that would be wonderful. We do have um, sign language interpreter with us this evening. Uh, the screen will only going to be separated like this for about uh, five, six minutes while Joni shows a, sh a short PowerPoint. But need the um, sign language interpretation in the meantime, you can just scroll, scroll through the list of, of people here and you should be able to find them. Uh, so uh, until we are able to get the full screen here. Uh, so thank you again, everyone uh, for joining us. And I'm going to hand, the, uh, hand this program over to Joni DiMartino. She is the museum curator, curator and the site superintendent of the Prudence Crandall Museum. Uh, she is a wonderful advocate for for the history for this history story, and um, we just are so we're so thankful that she joins us every year to help us coordinate these wonderful programs. So thank you, Joni. I'm going to hand it over to you. Sure. Thank you so much, Julie. And I also want to thank the Otis Library for initiating Harris Sisters Month a few years back. It's been an incredible annual presentation uh, every year. There's some really amazing topics and um, themes uh, that, that happen that are directly connected to the Harris Sisters, and they really deserve a lot of attention for uh, their participation in Prudence Crandall's school and, and helping to uh, integrate the school and um, you know, their, their bravery and just continuing education and abolition throughout um, their lives. And uh, I'm very excited today. We have, um, as you'd mentioned, we have a few people on from overseas. We have our two uh, speakers today. Um, I first met Wilfred Lupano uh, when he came to visit in 2019 in the summer, and he told me that he would, had been working on this book, and he uh, took the opportunity to stop by the museum um, while he was attending the American Library Association uh, annual meeting. And um, so he is from France and uh, his um, illustrator is also from France. The two publishers are from Belgium. We have a publisher um, that published the French edition and then a Euro comics with Stargold and then the Euro comics publisher, uh, which is um, publishing the other languages, including English. And they're the ones I would like to say thank you for, uh, for providing the free um, ebook that participants will be receiving at the end. And um, Julie, I also want to thank the Otis Library as well for um, the sign language interpreter as well. It's very important that we um, make this story as accessible as possible, uh, which is you know, part of the reason why we're celebrating the graphic novel today too. So um, we need to keep that, 
that uh, accessibility happening. Um, Wilfred and Stefan will come on the screen after I'm finished the PowerPoint, but I want to share a picture of them while I give their introductions before I just talk a little bit briefly about the museum. Uh, Stefan Fair over on the right there. Um, he's a writer, illustrator, and colorist who was born on March 6, 1985 in France. He attended a fine arts academy as well as studied animation. Today, he works in the fields of illustration and comics. In 2016, with Simon Kinsara, he co-wrote and illustrated his first book, Morgan, from Delcor Press, which was well received by readers and critics alike. His most recent works include Blanco Tour, which we're talking about today, um, created alongside scriptwriter Wilfred Lupano. He now lives in the French department of Pyrenees Atlantique. Wilfred Lupano on the left was born in Nantes in 1971, but it was in Pau that he would spend the majority of his childhood. His was a childhood spent buried in his parents' comic book collection, even if his boundless imagination and interest in writing is due above all to his love for role-playing games. As a young adult, Lupano worked as a server to finance his studies, a combination of philosophy and English, and soon he met two other young men, Roland Pignol and Fred Campoy, who would become both his friends and creative partners. Together, they would go on to create the humoristic Western, Little Big Joe, Delcor 2001, and that was just the beginning. Lupano quickly blossomed as a script writer, and over the following years, he penned countless titles, ranging from the four-part series, Alim Le Teneur, with Delcor 2004 to 2009, to the thriller Ma Reverence, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, also with Delcor. Then in 2014, alongside artist Paul Coet, he published the first volume of Les Vieux Fourneaux. And that was, uh, looks like it was his first book with Dargaud, who also published White All Around. Um, so it translates to Old Geezers. And Ablaze Publishing um, published the book in English. It was a major hit with critics and readers alike. And in 2017, Lupano went even farther afield with his adaptation of the legendary sci-fi series Valerian, collaborating with artist Matteo Lafray on the spin-off Shingulus <laughs> Incorporated, if again, pardon my pronunciations. His most recent work includes the historical fiction drama Blanc Autour, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, when the Otis Library approached me about you know, putting together a um, event for Harris Sisters Month uh, from the Prudence Crandall Museum, I immediately thought of this. And I thought April was just a perfect month for the end of April in particular for two reasons. The first is this April is the 188th anniversary of Prudence starting her school uh, for African American young women. And then also, right at the end of April, we are on the edge of free comic book day, uh, which I definitely wanted to mention because comic books and graphic novels are uh, kind of hand in hand at um, independent comic book sellers. And so I want to recommend to everyone to go out Saturday, uh, May 1st and get your free comic books. And uh, we're kind of participating a little bit in a way in this uh, program because we're offering this particular graphic novel for free to our attendees. And um, I just have this quote here by Prudence Crandall. My husband would not let me read the books that he himself read, but I did read them. I read both sides and searched for the truth, whether it was in science, religion, or humanity. So Prudence Crandall did marry. Her husband was not very supportive of her, uh, but she really encouraged people to read. And that is something that both the library, myself as a curator, and you know, I think even Prudence Crandall and the Harris sisters who were so supportive of education really encourage, whether you know it's a romance novel or a mystery series or the New York Times bestseller or self-published in the locals author section of a bookstore, you know, just read widely and don't let anybody tell you that you can't read anything or you shouldn't read anything uh, because of maybe it's, you know, considered youthful or, or not serious scholarship. I think it's all you know, books are how we engage in the world and stories are how we connect as human beings. And that's also how we connect to history. 
Uh, so this is a image of a photo of Prudence Crandall and the two Harris sisters, Sarah Harris Fayerweather, Mary Harris Williams. Uh, they make appearances all in uh, this novel that we're going to hear about today. So I wanted to share images of what they looked like later in real life. And this is the school probably looks a little bit different with uh, Stefan's um, pictures, but I wanted to just kind of set the stage with letting everybody know a little bit of um, what the school and the um, uh, people who were involved with the school and, and forming the school um, look like in, in real life. So right now, I'm just gonna give a very quick overview of the history of the school for those uh, who are joining us that for the first time that may not be as familiar with the Canterbury Female Boarding School and our place in American history. Um, so the Prudence Crandall Museum, we are a national historic landmark. So we are the original location and the original building of the school located in Canterbury, Connecticut. In 1832, Crandall, the white principal of the Canterbury Female Boarding School, was approached by a young African-American woman named Sarah Harris. She was asking to attend the academy. When residents protested the school's integration and parents threatened to withdraw their students, Crandall closed her school and reopened in 1833 only for African-American students. Her students came from several states. Connecticut responded by passing the Black Law. Here are some images of, um, from the book from uh, Canterbury residents not being happy. Uh, this is one of the students arriving from out of state. The um, states that the students came from were Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, and Pennsylvania, as well as students that did live in Connecticut. But Connecticut passed what was um, called the Black Law, which prevented out-of-state African Americans from attending school in Connecticut towns without local town approval. Crandall was arrested, spent a night in jail, and faced three court trials before the case was dismissed. In September of, of 1834, a nighttime mob attack closed the school. You can see in this image here, one of the students arriving from out of, out, out of state and a very unhappy Andrew Judson, uh, who was uh, Prudence's chief opponent here in Canterbury. And uh, this is the beginning of the school being attacked at night. And you'll see once you get the book yourselves, the, uh, the, the graphics that go along with that. Um, what's really crucial and important about this story, though, is that these events made national and international news in the 1830s. And they really served to galvanize the burgeoning abolitionist movement. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison was already publishing his newspaper, The Liberator. He was supporting Prudence and her endeavors. Uh, but the American Anti-Slavery Society Society doesn't get founded until about seven or eight months until after Prudence um, begins her school. So you're seeing this, this, this school is becoming a focus for the abolitionist movement to, to join together and have something uh, to fight for as well as ending enslavement. Um, Crandall v. State becomes the first systemic court case for African-American citizenship, and it serves as precedent for Dred Scott impacts Brown versus Topeka Board of Education and lays the framework for the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution. And the students, as I wrote in the afterword to this book, go on to do amazing things um, with the rest of their lives in abolition and activism in education um, and other endeavors. So it's, it's really amazing just the impact that this school, which was only open for 17 months, uh, really resonates throughout national history. And um, I just wanna especially thank Thank Dagur and um, your comics for publishing this book and because it's really helping us reach um, a larger audience and I am not one of those curators that nitpicks every little thing that um, might be done differently in um, an artistic medium that doesn't follow the historic record correctly because again it's about the stories and how those stories are um, um, placed in front of an audience to create empathy with the characters and, and therefore uh, the historic figures, because that's what we do in interpretation. We tell the stories that, that um, demonstrate relevance and connect people to pe uh, the people's lives in the past. 
Um, Prudence's story has been incorporated in theater performances, music and song. There's a ballet coming out in September about Prudence and Sarah's story. Um, Marilyn Nelson and Elizabeth Alexander, I'm going to mention because it's National Poetry Month, uh, created an incredible uh, crown of sonnets based on, on this story. Um, and now we have a graphic novel as well. There has been fiction uh, written about Prudence too. Um, but you know, when you see all of these languages that uh, this graphic novel is going to be coming out in and um, the different editions and different languages, this small story that happens in Canterbury, Connecticut that really has larger impacts is now reaching people all over the world. And it was an honor for me to, to write the afterword for this book. And, and I'm honored that Will has selected this story to write about um, because it's, it's really such an important story. And the fact that there are so many different characters, there are white women, African American women, white men and African American men um, throughout this story working together in history, it truly serves as a model for us collaborating now today in contemporary times against social injustice and, and in education, especially um, as we continue to move forward and try to make an equitable world for all of us. And I can't think of a better example of that than um, you know, Prudence Crandall, Sarah Harris, and their stories. And if it's a graphic novel that is people's entry into this story that helps them make that connection um, and empathize with our characters and, you know, make this make positive choices in their own parts of the world, then then even better. Then we're we're doing great work and we're continuing the work that Prudence and Sarah would have liked us to do. So having said that. <laughs> Julie, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to, um, I don't know how to stop sharing my screen, but I'd like to send the uh, hosting back to you and uh, we can bring Will and Stefan on and uh, have some author and illustrator interviewing. It keeps giving me new share, but it's not telling me how to stop sharing. Pause share. Stop share. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, Will and Stefan. It's a pleasure having you here this evening. We're very excited. For those of you who don't know, uh, France is about uh, you know five to six hours ahead of us. So uh, Will and Stefan are very generous to be here essentially in the middle of the night <laughs> participating in this. Um, so uh, because we are live, this is not a pre-recorded session. So um, I don't know if we'll get through all the questions this evening, but um, so Will, uh, how um, have you written about historic figures previously and, and how did you discover this story? What compelled you to write about it? Um, yes, I, I write very often about history. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite, uh, let's say, uh, passion in life. I, I, I have a few that I wanted to show you. I wrote a, a, a book about the guy who, um, um, who shot Che Guevara down uh, in Bolivia. It, this is the story of the guy who shot him. Uh, his name was Mario Terán. Um, I wrote uh, uh, three different books, but I have only two with me right now about the commune, the Paris Commune Revolution um, in the 19th century. Um, I have a, a new one coming very soon at Dargo's edition for the, for the end of the year also. So yes, history is one of my uh, favorite topic. It's, um, it's very, uh, to, to, to me, it's a very um, useful tool to, to, um, to touch the people in, in graphic novel, you know, because you, you can make them travel in different time and space and, and tell very uh, interesting stories. So uh, I was actually doing researches about two uh, very famous abolitionists uh, when I discovered the, uh, the Prudence Crandall story. I was trying to work on um, William Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, an abolitionist from Boston who um, 
and also about Frederick Douglass, who's a, a, a black abolitionist of the same time. And both had uh, very different uh, points of view about how to get to the, um, to the same result, which was abolition. And I, uh, my first plan was to make a story about their opposing. Uh, one was a legalist and the other, the, uh, William Lloyd Garrison was a legalist and uh, uh, Frederick Douglass was more into um, uh, uh, take what you, take the rights that you need by force. So when I was doing some researches about them, I discovered the story about uh, Prudence Crandall School because both of them talked about it and supported it. Uh, William Lord Garrison wrote about the, the school in his paper. And then it was a big uh, shock for me because uh, I thought the story was just amazing and totally unknown in France and Europe. We, I could hardly find anything about the, the subject. Uh, I ha actually had a hard time finding some resources. Uh, so I, not immediately, but I very soon decided that it was a better idea for me to write about what happened in that school because in comic books, very, very, very often, you know, comic books are uh, very manly things, you know, yeah. in Europe. It's uh, men doing graphic novels for other men. <laughs> During, during, it's very manly. Uh, during years and years and years, there was not so many uh, uh, female reader and uh, female author in graphic novel. It's changing very, very quick right now in Europe, but it was that way uh, uh, for years and years. And uh, so my point was to uh, tell the story of Prudence because there were only women involved in that school. And to me, it was very, uh, it was a very uh, important subject because it was uh, women fighting for their rights. So I Im immediately gave up my first uh, plan, my first manly plan, <laughs> and <laughs> moved into that second one. <laughs> and I'm so glad you did. Stefan, so have you worked with Will before? This is your first collaboration. How did you pair up um, as the artist and the, and the script writer for this particular novel? Uh, je parle français, du coup. Nazili, Nazili. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, talk, uh, in French and will be translated. Uh, Nazili, tu m'entends? Oui, je t'entends. I will be translated. Euh, alors oui, on a déjà travaillé avec euh, Wilfried avant sur euh, un bouquin pour enfants qui s'appelait Quand le cirque est venu. We have already worked with Wilfried before on this book about circus when the circus arrived. Donc euh, c'était un projet qui était très différent euh, puisque c'était l'illustration pour enfants donc euh, avec de l'humour mais qui était aussi engagé euh, d'une certaine façon. It was a very different project. It was a children's book with a children's illustration, but it also had a, 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 more, a, a more serious message. C'est toujours très intéressant de travailler avec Wilfried parce que à la fois on a, on a un univers commun sur certaines choses et à la fois il pousse à aller vers des choses très différentes, à sortir d'une zone de, de confort et pour moi c'est toujours très enrichissant. It's very uh, interesting to work with Wilfried because on many topics we have, we share the same opinions, but on other topics he actually, where, where our opinions differ, he actually pushes me to leave my comfort zone and explore other territories. So it's very interesting to work together. And that's extremely important as an artist to be able to, you know, push your, your, your challenge yourself to those boundaries, yes. Um, Will, how did you conduct your research? Um, I know you visited the museum and that was when we first met, but um, you had mentioned the research was a little bit difficult. Um, was there anything that was um, particularly useful to you? Uh, what was your um, experience like, you know, visiting the actual spot where uh, the, the school exists? When I uh, had the opportunity to, to visit you, the, the, the main part of my writing was actually over. Uh, you, you know it, 
because I presented you the the, the whole when, when we met, I was able to present you the, the the whole the whole thing. What was very useful being able to come to to see the museum is that it it made it suddenly made everything very real and. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I shot everything every from every angle with my GoPro camera and uh, because I needed to know uh, more about uh, the, the school in itself, but also around. And I needed to understand what the Canterbury countryside looked like, what was the distance between the main city and the school and uh, and all that material I was able to give to Stefan to help him understand better how how everything was set up uh, because you, you you need to have a perfect setup to to uh, to be able to tell the properly the story you know so this was the 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 first uh, thing it was quite yes difficult to find um, resources but I there's not much, but I finally uh, found what I needed. But you also know that in the in the graphic novel, I used a lot of fiction because I didn't want to make something really. Uh, it's not a historical essay. It, it's really a, a fiction based upon historical facts. Because I my 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 main concern was to um, to keep it. Uh, I had two main concerns. My my first concern was to keep it at a reasonable uh, level of understanding for people in Europe who are not very familiar with the uh, American uh, history of abolitionism and so on. And also, I wanted to make it accessible to a very young reader. I wanted to, the book to be uh, accessible to uh, to kids from 11 or 12 or something. Uh, so I didn't want to be too specific about the, um, the prosecution, the legal, uh, the, the, the civil and uh, the, the legal fight. Uh, and I, my point was more to, um, to tell a story that uh, uh, helped the people um, resent, like feel like what, what might have felt the, the, those, young lady, those young ladies in the school and Prudence, of course. Um, it, it's, um, it's more about feelings that knowledge in, in a way, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, once they, they read your book, they can come to the museum or, or visit our website and learn more about the actual, you know, processes of what occurred, uh, which again, you know, is, is why I think art is so important because they can always then come to the museum and, and hear more of the, the, the real story. And, you know, it's wonderful to hear how the museum inspired you as well while you were on site and how necessary it was to have those images um, for Stefan, because Stefan, your, your illustrations are just gorgeous. They're rich and beautiful. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you picked that, uh, the style that you did, um, how you approached um, portraying um, what Will was trying to do with um, readers and uh, reaching a certain age group in art. Uh, ben, merci beaucoup déjà. Um, alors, en fait, uh, moi, j'ai un style qui est beaucoup inspiré de, de l'animation, parce que j'ai fait des études là-dedans, et notamment de, de pas mal d'illustrateurs uh, euh, de Disney des années 50-60 donc j'ai un style qui se prête plutôt euh, au conte en fait um, Thank you very much for the compliment uh, my, uh, my style, actually my drawing style is very much influenced by animation because I studied animation and specifically by Disney animation in the 50s and the 60s Et, euh, En fait au départ quand Wilfried m'a parlé de cette histoire j'ai pensé que j'allais devoir peut-être changer de style, aller vers quelque chose de plus réaliste euh, ou semi-réaliste parce que c'est pas ça qu'on fait d'habitude. Euh, les... 
Um, and in fact, when Mofit proposed this project to me, I thought that I would have to change my style and make it a bit more realistic for this story because it is a historical, uh, because of its historical background. So I, I thought I would need to change my style. Mais en fait, euh, à la lecture du scénario, je me suis rendu compte que d'abord, Wilfried, il avait pris en compte mon, mon univers personnel. Il y avait beaucoup de choses qui, qui rejoignaient un petit peu le thème du conte, notamment l'aspect à la nature, euh, l'aspect à une forme, à des, des scènes un peu mystiques. Et, et donc, finalement, j'ai conservé mon style. And, but in fact, after reading the script, I realized that Wilfried had actually... Um, sort of he thought that my style would be would be suitable for this type of story that my my personal universe drawing universe that the mysticism of uh, would match the mysticism of the story the elements of nature and all of that so in the end i decided to keep uh, to do the graphic novel with my own style that's, that's uh, wonderful thank you c'était très bien de rester dans une simplicité parce que, comme vient de le dire Wilfried, on n'a pas essayé de viser quelque chose d'historique. Euh, on a essayé de créer de l'empathie, en fait. Et euh, donc, j'ai voulu que les visages, les expressions euh, restent euh, simples parce que je trouve que, euh, paradoxalement, plus euh, en dessin, plus un visage est simple, plus on a de l'empathie, plus on arrive à, à, à s'identifier au personnage. Donc, j'ai voulu que les visages des, des jeunes filles soient... Euh, soit vraiment très simple, deux billes noires, un trait pour la bouche et, euh, et euh, pour, pour créer cette empathie-là, en fait. And in fact, uh, I also realized that uh, uh, because one of the, the, the criteria that Wilfred had, uh, I needed to have a simplistic style in order for this book to be accessible to younger readers. And then uh, uh, it didn't have to be so detailed, uh, like historically uh, accurate, uh, also in, in the drawing style. And uh, while working, I realized that it's that simplicity that is going to help me transmit the, the feeling of empathy uh with the characters it's actually uh it might be a paradox but it's actually true that the simpler lines and simple uh, the more simple uh, simplistic style would actually transmit uh feelings and emotions the feelings and emotion of the girls better to the reader wow wow that's that's an interesting way of looking at it i hadn't thought about that and the the, the fascinating what i love about the graphic novel as a medium is that how much the um the illustrations are, are weighted equally really with with the text itself it, it is a, a just a beautiful medium um so will how did the character of savage or feral Um, help you step into a story about 19th century white and African-American women. For uh, uh, our um, listeners, uh, I should mention that uh, he is a, a, one of the early first characters um, that we meet uh, that, that introduces us into the book. Yes, and, and we, um, we must also say that it is a totally fictional uh, character that I made up. Um, I felt that I needed him to, um, uh, to set up properly the, the historical context, but also the, um, the philosophical context about what uh, abolitionism is uh, at that time. And um, uh, especially on two points, Ferrell uh, is the... Um, Uh, speaks for uh, Nat Turner, uh, which uh, uh, who's um, uh, a slave uh, who, who run uh, an insurrection one year before uh, uh, the, the the Prudence Crandall School opened for black uh, women. Uh, it was in another state. It, it was in Virginia, so it's pretty far. But still, at that time. It really had a very strong impact on uh, on the the, the white people uh, uh, psychology, and uh, uh, disappears in many many uh, historical uh, resources. And it was one of the topic against. It was th this story was used against the project of the Prudence Crandall School because the argument was we already know what happens when uh, black people pretend to, uh, to, to reach to uh, literature and, uh, and uh, knowledge. They just can't stand it and they turn 
to be uh, they, they they turn to freak out and and uh, and become murderers and so on. So uh, Ferrell is the uh, br bring that theory, but he is also he is many things actually in the book. Um, he is also uh, s someone who refuses. Uh, the, he's very skeptical about the idea of. Uh, uh, getting educated by white people. He's very skeptical about the, the whole project of the school. He doesn't buy it. And uh, he's like a, he, he's a, he's a um, uh, whistler to the, um, he's an alert, alert whistler to the girls saying, maybe you're going into a trap and you're trapping yourself. Uh, going into that school where you will receive nothing but the education of the white people, but you will never be white. This is a uh, this is his main uh, 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 topic in the in the book. But he is also um, a kid because he's a kid um, who, uh, who who refuses to. Um, uh, uh, how how could we say that in English? He refused to. Um, I can help. To to excuse himself for being here, he considers he belongs anywhere where he is. He is uh, legitimate uh, everywhere where he is, and he considers himself also uh, to be as red as black, and living in the in the in the wild, in the, in the woods. But in the same time, he is obsessed by the school and he's always around and he's criticizing the school, but he's also helping the girls and maybe a little bit in love with, with, with one of them. So he's a very um, uh, complex character in the, in the story. He is. He is very much so. And I, and I think he does an excellent job, as you said, kind of being that foil to what Prudence and the students are trying to accomplish and addressing a lot of those questions um, that I think people were addressing during that time period as well. And, and, it, and it's a complicated story today. You know, some of those questions we still, uh, you know, address, um, you know, is Prudence a white savior? Is something that has come up in the past? Um, you know, how, how, you know, did her her privilege, you know, positively work on behalf of the school and the students. Um, yet at the same time, it you know it certainly was privilege, so we have to address that. Um, yeah, I, he's a very subtle character. You know, he, he kind of his philosophy kind of grows. I think as the um, the story continues. Um, so Stefan, as far as illustrations go, um, how, how did you determine the costumes? Did you do research for that? Um, and do you approach historical figures differently? I know you talked a little bit about this as far as not having to change your style, but what did you feel you did need to, to bring differently to the, the drawing table? Um. Bah, en fait, au départ, j'ai fait des recherches effectivement sur les, les costumes de l'époque aux États-Unis et euh, je me suis aidé de, de pas mal de références que m'a donné Wilfried. Um... Yes, in the beginning, I did some research on the costumes and, and Wilfried also provided some materials for me. Mais euh, comme j'ai dit précédemment, euh, euh, en fait, j'avais plus envie de recréer une atmosphère euh, où on, on on sent en fait que ce soit le 19e siècle aux États-Unis, mais j'ai pas vraiment cherché à, à faire quelque chose de, de, de précis, euh, ni sur les costumes, ni sur les décors. Et, et, et d'ailleurs, euh, je pense que je pense que comme vous êtes dans la maison plus d'un scandale, vous avez bien vu qu'il y a eu beaucoup de choses sont inventées. Euh, mais en fait, pour moi, l'important c'est juste qu'on ait l'impression d'être euh, à ce moment-là au 19e siècle. And as I mentioned, yes, I didn't uh, put too much energy into being historically accurate in all the details. For me, the important was the atmosphere, the feeling that you are in the 19th century. Uh, the, the, I didn't put too much into the, the, the backgrounds and the, into the specific figures, but the, the whole thing had to fit together and give the impression that, the, give the feeling that this is when it happened. Oui, et par rapport aux figures historiques? Non, par contre, il y a juste, 
les recherches m'ont quand même aidé à éviter certaines grosses erreurs. Par exemple, sur les coiffures, euh, 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 bon, j'étais un petit peu déjà au courant de, de ces choses, mais quand même, euh, euh, j'ai appris que effectivement, les, les femmes noires à cette époque ne pouvaient pas avoir les cheveux, euh, euh, ne pouvaient pas avoir de coupe afro, ne pouvaient pas avoir les cheveux libres, elles devaient avoir les cheveux soit euh, euh, lissés et attachés. Euh, donc c'est pour ça qu'elles ont toutes en fait des, des, des coupes, euh, euh, je ne sais pas comment dire, euh, très spécifiques, des... très soignées. Très soignées, des, des coupes de, de cheveux de blanche en fait, elles ont toutes les cheveux lissés en fait, ce qui a mmh. perturbé certains lecteurs en France. Il y a des gens qui m'ont dit, euh, qui, qui ont été perturbés qu'elles qu qu n'aient pas des coiffures euh, euh, afro-américaines et en fait, euh, j'ai tout expliqué. Donc il y a quand même des, des recherches qui m'ont servi effectivement à éviter des erreurs. Uh, however, of course, I'm not saying that research was not useful, and, I, and I'm not saying I didn't take into account uh, uh, what I what I saw. And and this actually a specific example example is the hairstyle of the girls uh, of the African American girls, because oh, what I found interesting is that apparently back then the girls could not have their hair loose, <laughs> could not have an Afro hairstyle. Uh, they all needed to have a very um, Uh, very like specific, very, uh, I, would, I don't know how you would call it, but very well cared, specific hairstyles, so-called white hairstyles. And in fact, uh, um, what's interesting is that the readers in France were a bit surprised and if not shocked that uh, the girls were, were having their hair like that and there were no uh, Afro, Afro-American styles uh, instead. So for this, I really needed to do research, yes. Yeah. We, uh, we also decided sometimes not to respect the, um, the historical details. For instance, when uh, Joanny uh, 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 guided me uh, throughout the, the school, I, I could realize that there was not actually anything uh, such as what we understand today as a classroom with, uh, with benches and, uh, and so on. The, There were, the school is actually uh, made of uh, uh, different small rooms and you could have uh, three or four girls in that room, uh, seven or eight in another one, um, uh, studying at round tables or in a sofa or whatever. And, and uh, uh, to us, it was very difficult to make the, the 21st century audience understand that we're talking about a school with no, no codes from a school. So we decided to, to give up uh, this detail and show something that looks like a classroom for an audience today. Although when we do that, we know that we're not respecting history, but we, this is a tool that we need to tell the story. Exactly. And, and I think you certainly are respecting history. We're just, we're just utilizing the, as you said, the tools to get there. And um, there's a Disney movie that was done about the Prudence Crandall story called She Stood Alone. Um, and uh, they also did the same kind of uh, um, visual with the, the girls in the classroom that way too. Um, are there any parallels in French history to Canterbury, Connecticut? Um, I don't think so. I thought about it, but I don't really think so. What we have is, um, we, we have, uh, of course, uh, e examples in history about, um, um, uh, collective, uh, warm up like that, like, like, uh, angry mobs phenomenon uh, we we have very we have many of them um but not not totally about a school i don't think it happened but it it probably did probably in our former colonies or in the islands you know in the caribbean islands owned by france it probably happened yes it's certainly possible um 
it seems that the one character in the book, and there, there have been just wonderful, wonderful reviews on, on Goodreads and Amazon and other locations, but the one character that we meet as readers later in the book is an old woman, and she tends to get mixed reviews. It seems like some readers really get and really like the character, and there are other readers that don't understand her presence. And um, I wondered, uh, what you feel that she is sharing with the students that the character of Prudence could not share? Um, okay. Um, uh, this character to me, to us, uh, creates a link that it um, maybe more uh, European than actually American between what happens in that school and uh, a very um, symbolic character, uh, which is the witch. And uh, I had the, uh, the feeling very soon uh, when I started to write that story that it was a witch story. Uh, if you consider that uh, in, in the European uh, history, uh, more or less every time uh, women decided to do something uh, they were not expected to do, uh, which means get married and have children, they were very easily considered as witches and birds. Mm. And, um, this was a link that we wanted to create because it's not only a story about black women uh, claiming for their right, it's, it's, a, it's a story about women claiming for rights, uh, uh, first of all, in a way. So this was a link that we wanted to create uh, uh, also because uh, um, uh, the, this character, which is who's called uh, Miriam, uh, lives in the woods, uh, in the forest, and it was this very uh, particular link that we wanted to create between the girls and the nature, because we strongly uh, believe with uh, Stefan that um, any um, offensive uh, behavior against women is actually an offensive uh, behavior against nature. And uh, it is the same uh, evil in a way. So we wanted to have this character uh, stand for a kind of voice from the wild, voice from the, from the woods. And what, what she brings uh, different from from, Pruden from Prudence, in my opinion, is that she, she's much more what we could um, describe as a, um, as a militant, as a fighter, um, than Prudence. Prudence, to me, is a very interesting character because she was not um, uh, a passionaria, she, she was not uh, s someone really involved into the cause. It's the events uh, which uh, turned her into a, a fighter, a right fighter. Uh, to me, Miriam is more like a, 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 an activist in a way. Uh, we could say, yeah. and um, and uh, uh, to me it was also also a, a way to make um, uh, a bridge with a character from um, uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved. Oh, wow. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but in uh, in Beloved, uh, the the main character who's uh, Sede talks about her grandmother who used to preach in the woods. And uh, the, the character is called Baby Suggs. And uh, Baby Suggs is actually uh, uh, a slave, uh, a slave, an escaped slave. 
and uh, she she's doing some informal preachers in the woods for 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 the for the slaves and um, and to me the character of Miriam is a uh, is echoing baby sucks wow that's that's amazing there's there's so much there i can respond to um i didn't realize it was a it was a witch i kind of got the kind of neo pagan but i i um you know with the with the nature but um the the fact that you were making that extension further to the witch trials um uh, is, is just amazing and i and i love to hear that that, that is uh what you had envisioned I, I think that does come through very clearly um and I think it also unites the women, um, whereas race divides. I think the, the, the nature aspects unite the women together. Um, incidentally, I don't know if you know this, but I'm sharing this with our, our viewers and listeners that may not be aware of this too, um, that Connecticut was actually the first state, sadly, or, or first colony um, that um, persecuted women for, for, or prosecuted women for witchcraft. We were um, sadly uh, hanging women for the crime of witchcraft before Salem happened in 1692. Uh, so we do have those connections in our state. Salem is in Massachusetts, which is very close, right? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, every Salem is our most known. Um, there were a few other states, uh, Virginia as well, um, that did uh, put women on trial for witchcraft. Um, but Connecticut did execute several women for the crime of witchcraft before uh, Massachusetts did. So, so to me, what was interesting is that even the uh, to to me the definition of a witch at that time is very. Uh, can fo can fall on you very quickly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and because it's uh, it's based upon codes and um, uh, shortcuts and what was funny to me is that when uh, when the girls from the school met Miriam they themselves immediately said hey you're a witch <laughs> <laughs> you look like you 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 live in the woods with cats and you know, strange wood wooden house and you you look weird and you and it smells weird in your place with plants you know and herbs and yeah. you're probably a witch so they they themselves uh, are okay to put her in a in a in a case in a in some way yeah. and she responds what is exactly a witch because. Mind your definition because you might fit in. Right. So right. The, this was the the dialogue we wanted to initiate between those two generations, the two very different generations, the old and the 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 young, but also the the white and the the the, the black, but also the educated girls from the city and these very strange women from the woods. Right, right. And Feral is a character that embraces the woods too, but he's a male, so they don't seem, they seem more comfortable with his embrace of, of, of nature um, and just living in that, that life. Um, I'm wondering, will there be other novels on uh, Crandall and her students in the future? And that's, that's for both of you. Would we possibly see one where uh, Sarah Harris or um, Mary Harris Williams are the, uh, the main characters in a, a later story after the school's been closed? Is, is that a possibility in the future? There are many possibilities in the future. <laughs> the thing is, for, for, for the time being, no, but we never know. We, uh, first of all, because we never know about the success of a book and uh, the, the book has been released uh, just a few months ago right now. So we're not, we're not completely sure about uh, his destiny and uh, how good would be uh, the idea of uh, uh, going through the, the, the whole story again, but we, uh, we never know. Right, right. Um... What, what's been the international um, response from the graphic novel community? Uh, has it been supportive? I mean, like I said, the, the readers' uh, reviews seem to be very positive. That's for either one of you. <laughs> so far, so, so far the, the, the reviews are very good. Uh, and we, we're very happy about the, the, the reviews uh, on, on, 
on some of the country we 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 were able to uh, to read them because we 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 cannot we cannot see them all uh but we Nazeli, maybe you know you know more about it uh, actually about the um, worldwide thing yes the foreign right is the, the well the fact that it has sold in so many languages and this is just the beginning is actually the, the best proof that this is a book that will appeal to many readers in many, many different countries, because of course the whole world is following, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the movement, the, the, the for women, for, for, for African Americans, we are, the whole world is following this. So this, these are topics, it happened many years ago, the story, but these are topics that, are, that res resonate with many people all, all around the world today. So from that point what of view, it? it's been a success. Thank you. And the, the final question that I would just be curious to, to hear as, as the curator of the museum is um, how you both would like to see the museum incorporate the book into the visitor experience, besides, of course, being sold in our gift shop, <laughs> if you thought about that anyway. Uh, uh, can you translate? Uh, okay, oh, no, that's okay. you understood the question. Uh, we um, we didn't think about it, but maybe um, maybe a situational uh, reading would be nice uh, if, uh, if the the book is if, if the people coming to, to visit the the museum are, are able to uh, to read it, uh, let's say on screen or or uh, uh, on the on the inside the very school it's it's talking about that would be I think a, a nice experience to live. I think so too. Thank you so much, Julie. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to you to um, take questions from the audience. Yeah, sure, sure, no oh, problem. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, we do have a question here from Alana. She wants to know to both the writer and the illustrator. What were the major challenges you encountered, if any, in communicating the deepest meaning of this history? Um, I would say that the it's uh, the the main difficulty to me was to. Uh, uh, because I, I, I first, in a way, I first spoke to a French and European audience, and uh, most of the time they're not very familiar with the history of abolitionism, and uh, you, you very uh, quickly uh, go through it at school, and probably the same way uh, you go through French Revolution. So uh, it's, it, you have the feeling at the end that it just happened like that, uh, then suddenly there were session war, then Lincoln's uh, abolition is, is, is uh, slavery is over, and this is pretty much what we learn at school, you know. So it's very difficult to um, to to talk about a story like that, which occurs during the process of abolitionism, which was quite a long process. It was not just after the secession war, uh, as we are taught in school. It's it's a very long process, and and uh, and uh, it, it it's very difficult to to explain to an uh, European audience that at that time you had already states uh, where abolitionism, uh, where slavery was already over, and. Uh, but where black people had no rights anyway. So this is the this is the touchy part of the story for an uh, European audience is the, the is the historical background. Oh thank you. Does um if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Is there anything uh, specific that you uh, that you would like to ask? Show your face and talk to us. Yes, I was gonna <laughs> be nice to see everyone's face too, but I know not everybody's comfortable with that. <laughs> no problem. Stay yeah. stay. <laughs> Joni, did you have any other questions? No. 
Okay. Well, we can, um, if, if nobody has any more questions, we can wrap it up. I know, Joni, did you want to talk about the, um, about the book or? Oh, here we go, yes. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Is the book for sale in the United States now? Uh, it's, it, uh, Nazari, you, you answer that question. Yes, it is currently available in digital edition as an ebook everywhere where you buy ebooks on the, the, the biggest ebook retailers, Amazon, Apple, Google, and hopefully it will also soon be available in print. There's another question. That's great. And um, what are some projects that you are working on now or, or will be working on soon? Do, what do we have to look forward from, from you? Um, uh, by the end of the year, I will publish a new, um, um, historical uh, graphic novel at, uh, at Dargo's edition. And uh, this time it's talking about books and like in librarians, so you you might be interested. <laughs> and um, it it occurs in the in Spain in the 10th century when when uh, Spain at that time was a Muslim caliphate, and uh, it it talks about um, burning the biggest uh, library of that time, where uh, hundreds of Thousands of books were burned by uh, radical uh, Islamists. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, it, it, and uh, uh, I'm telling the story of the the archivist of that uh, library who tries to uh, save uh, some books as much as he can, as many as he can, uh, by putting them on the on the back of an old mule. Oh. Uh, but he puts way too many books on the mule, so the mule is almost, you know, dying under the weight of the books. Um, and he tries to escape uh, with the, the international knowledge of that time uh, on the back of the mule to, to put the, the, the books where they will be safe, he thinks. So it's based upon uh, historical facts, like the burning of the library is an historical fact, and uh, the the mule uh, loaded with book is a total uh, uh, fantasy from my twisted mind. That sounds really fascinating. Dawn has her hand raised. Yes, Dawn. Yes. Hi, gentlemen qui est euh, euh, un projet d'aventure fantastique, donc c'est de l'invention, mais euh, c'est euh, sur un groupe de, de, de femmes euh, dans, dans un monde post-effondrement euh, post euh, qui doit survivre à une catastrophe euh, écologico-fantastique. Voilà, donc je reste un peu sur le thème des, des sorcières. Um, I am actually writing and drawing uh, an adventure fantasy book uh, set in a post-apocalyptic uh, world um, where the characters are writing a book. Is it correct? Did I make a mistake? C c no, okay, sorry, I wasn't sure about the post-apocalyptic. And there's also uh, ecological themes in the book. Um, so this is what I, Stefan is working on now. So I put, I put a, a, a black and white page of the book I told you about the mule uh, in, into the chat. So I think everybody can see it right now. If you click on it, it should open. Let's see. Yes, it works. So you can see a mule eating a book. <laughs> Oh, Don, did you have a question? I did. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you so much for this interview. It's awesome. Um, my question was, did you have a difficult time convincing the, um, the company that prints your books or the, that uh, develops your books that they should be interested in it? What was your take on, on selling this book to them? Actually, I didn't. Uh... They were 
they had the same uh, reaction uh, as I had when I first read it. They when when I pitched the story to them, their reaction was, "How does it come that we don't know that story? Because it's amazing." And so it was it. My, and my answer was like, "I don't know, but let's let's make it popular." <laughs> and uh, because you have everything to me in that story, you have so many uh, themes, so many uh, political matters. So so many um, philosophical matters, and uh, and it's so um, and it's so modern. Also, it's so contemporary, um, especially for a young audience. I think it's there's a lot of power on it and a lot of hope because of uh, what the the girls turn uh, what the girl uh, began after they 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 experienced the Prudence Grendel School. So uh, so no, it was not very difficult, and uh, there was a good enthusiast, uh, enthusiasm uh, around the, the, the whole project. Well, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm a descendant of Mary, so that makes me happy that I can share this with my grandchildren. Incredible, nice. Also, we, we are even happier than the, than the book. It's, really, so. it's great, thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank you. We're so fortunate, Don. Uh, Don has been on our Harris Sisters Committee for the, for the past few years, helping us plan programs every year. So uh, she, and she actually presented a program about her genealogy research of her family this year that, was, that went very, very well. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna look and see if we have any more questions on the chat. Um, is it ever mentioned that the United States was one of the first countries to abolish slavery? Sorry, say that again. Oh, I, I have it. Yep. No, it's, uh, you mean in the book, is it mentioned? I think that's what they mean, yes. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not mentioned. We didn't, uh, the, the story takes place uh, 30 years before it was done. Uh, al although it was done in the in the in the Connecticut at that time, but uh, I, I think I think you mentioned it maybe uh, joining the post in the, in the afterwards. I I, I may have um, Connecticut's a little bit complicated because we actually established what was called um, gradual emancipation. So by 1784, um, if you were a certain age, you know, you were emancipated or you had to wait until you became 21 before you were emancipated. Um, so when Prudence established her school, there were still actually 20 enslaved African Americans still living in Connecticut. So when the students are coming to the school, there are still African Americans who are under enslavement within the state. So um, that's, a, that's a kind of a, a powerful paradox there that's that's a crime. Um, so, you know, other states did have, I think, some, you know, uh, you know, emancipation that may have been immediate, but but Connecticut was was not one of them. Um, we were considered a, a fairly conservative state as far as our relationship to um, to African American communities um, uh, that were free, sadly, uh, you know, it's, it's instituting things like the black law. And uh, for what I know, so in France, we abolished uh, slavery at the revolution, but Napoleon uh, put it back again in 1815. Uh, because it was serving his project uh, on his war against the Ir the English people, so we had we had back and forth. Uh, we abolished twice the, <laughs> the the slavery in a way. So wow. Implicated also on the French uh, uh, side. Yeah, and Napoleon also removed a lot of um, gains that women received during the revolution as well. He rolled a lot of that back. Um, we do have a comment here from Tom Such that many countries abolished slavery before the US. I know England was one of them. Um, and slavery, of course, being abolished with the 13th Amendment in 1865. But Connecticut was the last New England state to completely abolish it in 1848. Thank you, Tom, for that. You're, you're absolutely correct, yes. Are there any other questions? Uh, 
especially um, uh, uh, to it makes me uh, go back to one of the former question about what was difficult to uh, to 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 make people and understand in that story. But one, uh, for the French audience, uh, especially when I uh, uh, when I started to pitch that the story of the prudent school, um, people. Uh, thought that they already knew, knew the story hmm. but but they were thinking about something hap, uh, happening in uh, uh, 1960 you know wow yeah yeah it's it's but fascinating like, you know, there's a mistake because we're talking about 120 years before so so you know you you don't have it right so it's it, so i had to focus Every time I had to focus on it was before the slavery was abolished, way before, 30 years before is a long time. So, um, so for a French audience, this was not easy to, uh, to realize that I was not uh, telling a story about the, the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the parallels that our story has to the 1960s are, are sadly very similar. And um, I've been in touch with the Little Rock uh, Central High School historic site, and they want to work with us collaboratively as well, because, yeah, the, the stories just, you know, it seems like we are reliving the same history every century, and that's not okay. Um, I, the one question that I would probably just ask as a final wrap up, um, is, it, is there anything that you both would like to share with us that maybe I had not asked you about that you would have liked me to have asked? Um, si je peux. <laughs> euh, moi, je voudrais juste conseiller un livre que j'ai lu. Euh, tu peux traduire, Nazélie. Je voudrais conseiller un livre que j'ai lu euh, pendant que je faisais le blanc autour qui s'appelle euh, Moi, Tituba, sorcière de Marie Scondé euh, et euh, qui parle justement de la seule sorcière noire de Salem qui a été complètement oubliée dans l'histoire euh, donc c'est une fiction je uh, pas. I would like to uh, just suggest uh, a book for you to read uh, that I was reading while I was working on White All Around um, so uh, Stéphane will help me uh, it's by Ma uh, Marie Scondé Marie Condé. Et le livre s'appelle Moi, Tituba, sorcière. Tituba, c'est quoi But, uh, it, it's, I don't know how it's translated. We can maybe uh, research. Uh, in English, it's, it's about a witch, me, uh, the witch. And it is about, it's a fictional story. Non, c'est pas une vraie. Alors, c'est une histoire euh, inventée, mais à propos d'un personnage qui a existé, qui était la seule sorcière noire de Salem. Uh -huh. It is a, a historical fiction, so it's based on the life of a real character, of a real of a, a person who was the only black witch in Salem. Um, so it's sort of like a fiction, fictionalized. I Tituba the witch. Yes, I to say I, I have read it. It's called I Tituba, and uh, it's I believe it, it won awards. It's an amazing book, and I'm I'm so glad to hear that you read that, Stefan. That it inspired you. It, it, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful book. As a matter of fact, um, the Peabody Essex Museum or Peabody Essex, I'm not sure how they pronounce their name, um, in Salem recently had a witchcraft exhibit, and they had a, a book discussion featuring uh, that book. Um, and their exhibit, I believe, is online too. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to, to look at that, I think they still have it available as a as a 3D tour. Yeah. Uh, we do have one comment from Dora Yang that she says that not a question but a comment. As a Canadian, I definitely didn't know about this story before I read your book. I'm so glad I learned about it this way. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if uh, she is still on. I don't. I don't see her name. Um, Oh, there she is. Yes, she is still on. Uh, Dora, I wanted to let you know that uh, one of the students in our school, um, and I mentioned this in the afterward, um, does end up residing in Canada.
Canada later in life. Um, her husband is uh, a self-emancipated man. And so when the fugitive slave law is passed, uh, they have to escape America and they go to Canada where they become the final spot on the Underground Railroad. They start a newspaper and a refugee society and, Can and, Canadia and Canada <laughs> acknowledges their um, contributions to the lives of um, African Canadians. So uh, I hope you find more um, uh, just inspiration and um, uh, things that you would like to learn about, uh, about Mary Miles Bibb and Henry Bibb um, in the book too. Yeah, I think that's... Well, I think that probably wraps everything up um, unless anybody has any last minute questions, but I just wanted to, to thank all of you for attending this evening. And uh, for those of you from outside of the country, we are so happy. Um, I just kind of made a quick note when I asked everyone to mention where they were from. And it looks like we have people here from Chile, uh, from Belgium, Ontario, uh, France, from the states, um, Illinois and Massachusetts. Um, right here, several people from around Connecticut also. So thank you all so much. Thank you for a wonderful evening. And Joni, do you have any last minute, uh, last minute comments? No, we're just hoping to oh, reopen the museum in 2022 in the spring. So I'm hoping uh, you can come join us if you can't visit us in person because you're, you're, you live a distance. Uh, we do have a 3D tour online also that you can check out. So um, I can be reached at joan.demartino at ct.gov. I will put that in uh, the chat there. And uh, just deeply grateful for all of you joining us today and for the Otis Library for hosting. And of course, Stefan and Wilfred and Azeli and um, uh, Valerie from uh, Belgium. Just uh, this has been an amazing program, and thank you so much. This was a wonderful opportunity to talk to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Stefan, be safe getting home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We are going to bed. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. We have Stefan back home. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. It was very nice. Okay. Bye, bye. bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank Good you night. very much. Thank you.